What is up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I am your humble horse host, P. Rogers, and I am joined uh, this week by just one of my fellow nerds, the working girl, Jordan Smith. Jordan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I already have one dynasty draft in the can, so Ooh. I'm I'm getting ready until there's probably going to be like a three month cooling period of football and just all training camp videos all the time, baby. All hype bids, all constantly. That's that's what we need. That is where you make the winning decisions for your fantasy team in 2023 is based on what player has the most hypest bids is how I draft a whole team. It's amazing how many teams feel like they're the best team right now. And everybody's like, oh, Eagles, this chalk it. it up. They're going to the Super Bowl. But uh, it usually doesn't go that way because it is, oh, it's May 3rd now, but you cannot pick a winner in April and a roster is incomplete by then. So who knows what will happen? It's all kinds of chaos. I do feel like I should – Maybe maybe this is the year I try drafting a best ball team of only players with hype videos and see how good that team does. I wonder what if they, they live hit, up to the hype. Right. I wonder what the hit rate is for a hype video. I think that's that's maybe maybe that's my next article for Nerdball is as I'll look through the past three fantasy seasons and like who had the most shared hype video and how did they perform in fantasy that year. It's it's like it's gotta be hype video and like if Twitter blows up for a day because somebody caught a pass in the corner of the end zone and it was freakish or we get a 100%. really weird picture of somebody's quads. That's just yes, <laughs> them yes. standing on the practice ad- sideline in their shells and they just have their big quads to hang it out. That's perfect. That's perfect. How many times has Twitter as, as an, as a player been the talk of Twitter because of a picture or a hype video and how well has that person performed the following season in fantasy? These are the correlations that like you laugh at as a fantasy manager, but you know, maybe there's something there. Maybe that's how true uh, fantasy success and consistency is performed is based upon players who blow up the internet. Hey, sometimes you just have to speak it into existence. Exactly. I'm going to have a wide receiver one season. You've got to share it and you've got to just put it in the universe manifesting. Agreed. Agreed. That's the only way to do it. Uh, 100% here for it. We are going to get into some rookie talk. Obviously, the NFL draft has come and it has gone. We talked about the rookies heading into the draft and kind of gave a quick layout of where we were feeling them. And now we actually know what teams they're going to be playing for Jordan in 2023, which gets us even more excited. Um, So we're going to talk some must draft rookies for 2023 fantasy football. I mean, we'll we'll talk dynasty. We're going to talk maybe a little redraft, but I know Jordan and I are both in full dynasty mode right now. Um, My voice is, is hit or miss. It's warming up right now. I was at the Celtics game Monday night and, uh, and still recovering from that. So I'll, I'll maybe be a little bit more of a listener than a, than a contributor, but we'll see. Uh, I might just push my, you know, you know, push through it, Jordan. That's what podcasting and hosting is all about is you grit your teeth, you bear it, and uh, you got to earn those incentives. You know, minutes, minutes on the mic is a big incentive on my, uh, on my unguaranteed contract. You just have to grind through it. You know, it, it's like Will Levis with his mm. turf toe issue. He, he just toughed through it. Didn't make him a first round pick, but you know. But the grit is there. The grit, yes. The, the, you got to grab your lunch pail and just put in the work. <laughs> um, I feel like I, I, I just want to briefly touch on this player because it's a guy who we are both extremely hyped on. Um, and so I don't feel like we need to spend too much time talking about him. But I feel like I can speak for both of us, Jordan, when we say if you are playing in a super flex dynasty league, your 101 this year is Anthony Richardson. Uh, given the fact that he has the athletic profile that is just second to none and now is going to a Colts team where he's playing under the head coach who turned Jalen Hurts into a Super Bowl quarterback uh, and got him $200 million plus dollars. And you love that. I love that pairing. Uh, you love to see it. You love to see Anthony Richardson go to a team like the Colts. And I think that he 
we talked about him basically being the 101 in our minds in super flex leagues before the draft even hit. And now that it's to the Colts and that's that position is solidified for me, it's a no brainer. What do you think? Uh, I still have Bijan Robinson. Are we talking just dynasty, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm still, I'm still taking Bijan Robinson. Um, he's also like just shooting up boards on redraft leagues as well, because um People know with Atlanta that with um, Arthur Smith and that running game and the Giants that they're just posting all over this team, whether that's Corderell, Kyle Pitts, Drake London, and Mac Hollins are both like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, dudes. So um, I still have Bijan Robinson one. Anthony Richardson is in a great spot, though. Um, I thought Indianapolis would be a nice place for him because of the Steichen match. Um, I think that his rushing ability and the experience that that coaching staff has with a running quarterback might uh, lift his floor up this season. Um, I'm still just uncertain about the ceiling. I I do feel like he has a pretty high ceiling. Uh, I just, I feel really like I can't, I feel like I don't want to guarantee anything yet because there's Cause there's been a lot of hype videos. There's no hype videos. I, it's mostly it's uh, maybe I'm just hedging and I'm I need to just like forget put, about put everything the flag that I've been hearing. But it's like because people are comparing him to you know Justin Fields and Cam Newton, and he referred to himself as um, Cam Vic at some point or whatever, or Michael Newton. I forget what it was, but. Um, <laughs> I'm Those just very, trying to very temper. different people, in my opinion. Cam Vic and Michael Newton sound like very. Those are two extremes of of kinds of people. <laughs> Cam Vic definitely sounds like a football player. Michael Newton. Michael is, Newton is is, is a professor at MIT. Your, <laughs> <laughs> he is a professor, and he has created uh, many different robotics, and he's working with Chat GPT right now. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Actually. So because of that, maybe I'm overthinking it. I have Anthony Richardson third on my Ooh, okay. list of dynasty rankings. I actually have Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, second, um, largely because I feel like he can have a really good career in Seattle. I think he can have a pretty good instant connection with Geno Smith. And uh, we might touch on this later. We have some receivers that are going into some crowded rooms, JSN being one of them. But I think there's a chance that, like, Tyler Lockett maybe takes a step back. He's already showed his age last season. DK Metcalf, um, sometimes he gets dinged up. You know, sometimes he's not always on the field. So I think there will be opportunities for Jackson Smith and Jigba to be the second wide receiver in Seattle on some game days. And, um, you know, if, if you if you draft Anthony Richardson that high and – I feel like I always have bad luck with quarterbacks on, I mean, okay. Besides Lamar Jackson, Lamar Jackson, I'll hold my hat on forever (laughs) that I thought he was going to be good all along, but I'm just a little worried because I don't know yet. And dynasty it's, it's a different animal because if you mess up on a quarterback, then you might end up, maybe not even in a position next season to grab one of the guys that you really want, or uh, it can get a little dicey. So th- that's why I just have them at third right now. Which I, which obviously uh, still, still the top quarterback on the board this year in, in dynasty. Um, and you liked, and you had Bijan. who's a, who's another must draft rookie for you. Who's a guy who's towards the top of your list in terms of like, these are guy who I'm going to make sure I'm going to get out of every draft I possibly can with him. I think people definitely shouldn't be afraid of drafting Jameer Gibbs. Um, it, he's, I feel like he's taking more heat right now than is deserved based on his draft position. Like if uh, I, Ben Solak had like a awesome Twitter picture of like the Lions entire draft. Cause I, I was a little bit bewildered at what the right lines were doing, especially after day one, I was like, what the fuck are you guys doing <laughs> and he, he switched he switched just, basically the players around if you change the draft order it's like a fucking gorgeous draft it's an amazing draft yes exactly it's an amazing draft except 
at the time they drafted Jameer Gibbs with a top 15 pick when they already had two viable starting running backs on their roster. And then they drafted a linebacker who can't cover um, <laughs> off ball linebacker. <laughs> Uh, but I still like Jameer Gibbs, and I like him more now that they just did away with DeAndre Swift. Um, I think if they like him enough to just be like, you know what, we're not going to wait for 18, even though he is probably going to be available at yeah. 18. We're going to draft him at 12, and I think that means he's going to get the rock. I think he's going to be um, in there for most of their passing downs. Uh, as opposed to David Montgomery, and I, I still think David Montgomery can still be a very good. Uh, fantasy option I just think when you're looking at this backfield compared to last year Jameer Gibbs sub him in for DeAndre Swift and David Montgomery subbed in for Jamal Williams and David Montgomery is better than Jamal Williams so I I think that he still holds a lot of value and if you want Jameer Gibbs at RB2 I I recommend just going for it because I think he's going to get a lot of work still I think so too and I think I I love what you said the fact that the Lions drafted Jameer Gibbs where they did and then traded DeAndre Swift to the Eagles to the Eagles. We'll touch on that maybe, but that's also just, Oh man. But for a fourth round pick, like immediately makes me agree. with I totally agree with you where it's like Jameer Gibbs is their guy and he's extremely effective in the passing game. And we've seen that before with the Jared Goff offense, right? We saw in Todd Gurley's like heyday, like the 2017, 2018 season Gurley was, you know, not Christian McCaffrey seeing 100 plus targets, but saw 80 plus targets both those seasons and went over, you know, 788 yards in 2017 and then 2018, 580 yards um, through the air as a pass catcher. So, like, I think that we can see uh, Jameer Gibbs become a pretty viable part of this of this Lions offense, especially as like they needed pass help, like pass catchers uh, alongside Amon Ross St. Brown. And they traded TJ Hawkinson. So like Jameer, like if you just treated Jameer Gibbs as a wide receiver, I wonder how people would feel um, in terms of value and then also just fantasy. Um, But yeah, I like that. I like him a lot as, as a player whom you, because of the negative draft press, I wonder if maybe not in dynasty uh, he'll drop in value, but in redraft, you might be able to get him at a decreased value because of, uh, maybe the negative associations around value. Of course, if you're drafting come August and there's, you know, 300 hype videos of Gibbs just like roasting linebackers on wheel routes and and just taking it to the house, then uh, then good luck drafting him and, <laughs> and any kind of decreased value. But the Gibbs call, I like a lot. He's a good player too. Uh, yeah. I think that um, outside of everything, what I've tried to do over the past couple of years is just, try to bet on talent more than anything i i think that that will no matter what situation these guys are in if you truly believe they are as talented um as to be the the guy to be number one then trust your gut and go with it because eventually that cream rises to the top like deandre swift was an rb1 not long ago so sometimes things just change on a dime and um just trust your evaluation yeah. Yeah. Uh, a wide receiver. I know you talked about Jackson Smith and Jigba, but a wide receiver who I am loving their landing spot is Jordan Addison to the Vikings. He's a, a, a must guy for me, both in dynasty and in redraft. You can look at the kind of those, there was that block of four first round wide receivers who all went just Jackson Smith and Jigba to the Seahawks, Addison to the Vikings, Quinton Johnston to the chargers and then Zay flowers to the Ravens. Ooh, okay. I mean, he still might beating hard on that one. Um, not sure it's going to translate to maybe huge fantasy production, but we can touch about talk on that later. But Addison of those four feels like the guy who's most likely to step into the largest role from day one, given the fact that the Vikings a love to throw the football, um, b Adam Thielen left in free agency, and you're looking for that number two wide receiver alongside Justin Jefferson. T.J. Hawkinson is probably going to be <clears throat> the second target. Um, for Kirk Cousins in this Vikings offense, but maybe Addison challenges Hawkinson for that number two kind of receiver. He's certainly going to be the number two receiver, uh, wide receiver in terms of death chart, in my opinion. Like he's battling KJ Osborne, who I like KJ Osborne and his and his nerd ball metrics paint him as a very boom uh fantasy performer. 
but I, you know, we didn't see a whole lot from him in season uh, in last year. And so I think Addison adding to this Vikings offense, that's going to look to move the ball. Um, I, I love it. I love Addison this year and I love him in dynasty moving forward, regardless of what the Vikings do at quarterback. Yeah. If I'm looking at um, a redraft ranking, if I did one of those, in terms of rookies, I, they wouldn't be very high, these wide receivers in redraft league. I'm not really looking at a lot of them at this point in time just because of their situation, but Jordan Addison is probably closer to Jackson Smith than Jigba, if not passing him in redraft leagues just yeah. based on it, – it seems like the wide receiver two position is just his to go and take if he really wants it. Um, <clears throat> I, I think he's also just – he's a really talented player um i don't i don't think he comps too far away from um I, I don't i don't know a good comparison but some of the bigger wide receivers like i think he does play a little, little bit bigger than some of these other little little guys um particularly the ones that went <clears throat> later um i i think getting a first round grade on jordan addison if you're the vikings that must mean you trust him to hold up mm -hmm. um i I just hope he doesn't face a whole lot of press coverage and he'll be good. And, and honestly, I kind of like, I would trust, um, Ke Kevin O'Connell. That's yeah. 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 Kevin O'Connell right? too. Now I'm Is doubting right? it. <laughs> I, I think it's Kevin O'Connell. I think that's right. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yes, it is. I would trust him to like, be able to scheme something up to like get Addison off of, you know, if, if they find that press is an issue for him, like getting him in motion and then, you know, doing that kind of stuff to get him off of press. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a, a guy certainly in dynasty. And I feel like, you know, again, there's those four wide receivers who all went in the first round and they all have name value and they all went to good spots, um, spots that you can really talk yourself forward in. And of the, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba, the big, you know, the biggest name of the class to the Seahawks, which is, you know, a good landing spot, but like Jordan Addison, I feel like could be as uh, a guy who's a little bit sneakier um, in terms of, in terms of where you're going to get him. Quinton Johnston, like going to the chargers with a team that, you know, Keenan Allen, they've been looking to kind of quote unquote trade or like, I feel like they're quietly moving towards that. He's getting older. Justin Herbert is, you know, basic. I think he's like, three or four years older than Quinston Johnston, um, Quinton Johnston. So basically the idea is like that those two could be, you know, running mates for, for a long, long time. Uh, and you have Mike Williams there obviously, but like there is a world in which Quinton Johnston, like in the next couple of years is the wide receiver one in at Los Angeles for what should be a high powered offense with Justin Herbert under center. So like that's very intriguing in, from a dynasty format and then if you believe that uh, the Ravens are going to suddenly change their whole offense and not become a run first deep uh, run first team and, and let Lamar, you know, cook Zay flowers seems like a, a, you know, another guy. So anyways, my point being is that Addison might be, might be maybe the forgotten or the lesser uh, loved of the, in that group of four. And so maybe there's a little decreased value there. I don't know. I'm all about value, Jordan. Yeah. I, when you when you t mentioned the uh, like the name brand for wide receivers that went in the first round, <clears throat> I, I think when you look at Jordan Addison, it's can Jordan Addison take away uh, targets, take away snaps from KJ Osborne? Yes, yeah. he absolutely can. The other guys uh, we already talked about JSN. You're like, oh well, DK Metcalf get hurt at some point. You don't want to hope for that, but like you're you're same wondering thing. same thing with Mike Williams in LA. Mm -hmm. Um Odell and Rashad Bateman in Baltimore both have had their struggles with injuries. Uh Keenan Allen, as you mentioned, is on the opposite side of 30. Same with Tyler Lockett. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of like if you drop Jordan Addison, you can also stay away from the like negative wish casting of yeah, uh, for sure. <laughs> I, I I hope this person does what they always do and pulls a hamstring. Yep, and is often in and out of the lineup for six weeks. Uh, who's another must draft rookie for you this year? Um, 
Who are you liking? Someone I would love to get some dynasty. Some dynasty love on. I, I have a few. I, I've been I've been getting too deep on this. <laughs> um, hey man, that's what we're here for. That's what the people want to know, Jordan. Um, I love Devin A. Chain in yes. or Devon A. Chain in Miami. Yes. Um dude is uh track speed fast. Uh he's a little on the smaller side, but Mike McDaniel is also a short king, and he's like, I love short kings, and I've loved Devon A. Chain forever, so please let's take him. Um, I love hearing stories about that. Like, I yeah. love when the coach is like, yeah, I'm obsessed. Or, like, with Zay Flowers, I, I like him as a dynasty pick because he just seems – everything you hear about him is it just seems like he's going to come in and work, and he's going to try at least to earn something. And I'd rather bet on that than, like, the guy who uh, you might have heard was just – skipping a few practices or the, the guy who walked out of the green room. I don't think anybody actually did that, but you know what I'm talking about? The character issue guys. Um, so Devon a chain in Miami, he is the third running back on the depth chart. Um, but he also has uh, Raheem Mostert who kind of has some, some glass ligaments in his yeah, legs. We're talking about um, players who probably get injured during the year. Who, who I love, still love him, still love his speed. Um, I still love D- Jeff Wilson. Um, I-, I don't know. I just think there's going to be some weeks when Devon A. Chain just pops. He's going to have like a 75 yard run. You're going to be like, why didn't I play him this week? And you're going to be like, cause he only had three other touches, but <laughs> the explosion is huge. He feels like, he feels like a guy to me, him and, and uh, Roshan Johnson for the bears. Those feel like later round guys who are drafted in like the third round and later whom have the best chance of winning their backfield and like being having a much larger role than their draft value might indicate because of the fact that there's just not really like a huge name in front of them. Uh, like Devon, Devon H a, like, you know, you have Raheem Mostert and you have Jeff Wilson, but like, you know, the, both of those guys have flashed. Both of the guys are solid. Both have, you know, uh, Raheem Mostert, I guess has injury issues. But like a change speed is just so abs- the speed of that offense is absurd in general. And then Rashawn Johnson, the Bears, what have who's there? Who else? Who, uh, it's K- K- Khalil Herbert, Khalil Herbert, Khalil who Herbert, and um, Deontay Foreman, my guy. Yeah, Deontay Foreman. Like, I like both of those guys, but th- there's just instances where you're like, okay, I can, there is a very easy narrative for me to spin where the running back room shakes out that those guys actually have a lot of a much bigger role the second half of the season than maybe we anticipate going into drafts. And those are the guys who I love to like take bets on because especially in redraft, obviously, because you can get that advantage in the second half, but also, you know, also in, in, uh, in dynasty, depending on where they are, they're hard. Those are hard picks for dynasty because you could, it could be something where they like completely win the starting gig. And you're like, awesome. I now have a starting running back for the next five years. And that's awesome. And I locked that up in the later rounds of a draft, but it also could be something where like, they're great for that one season. And then the team still goes out and drafts a running back in like the second or third round, the next year's draft to like, you know, it, it, dynasty for those guys, when it's not a, like clear locked in, we put a ton of value a, into those backs. It's hard for me to like be super confident in that. I like, I like taking the flyer and then maybe uh, like I did this with Devon, uh, Devin, Devon, Devin Pierce, Devon Pierce, Damian Pierce. Damian there it is. Pierce. <laughs> Damian Pierce. I did this with Damian Pierce last year where I drafted him out as a, on a flyer. Then he had that huge preseason and then I used him as a trade package. Uh, to get me some pieces in dynasty. And so like, that's, that's the kind of move to where you like take the guy, if they ball out, that's great. And then maybe you move him um, just because of the fact that like, especially at the running back position, it's such a fickle thing. If they burst out in the scene, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be replaced or at least challenged their second year. Yeah. I I think um, I I love that you brought up Rashawn Johnson too, because he's one of those guys who I, I've been trying to take a better look at. Um, he was behind B. John Robinson at Texas. So it's like, okay, cool. He wasn't as good as B. John Robinson. <laughs> but who is? Few of us are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean he's not going to be a good NFL player. And I, I think I was trying to think of um, some scenario comps. And I think that like either these guys, Devon A. Chain and Roshan Johnson, I think 
actually I'll go give this to Kendry Miller too because Kendry Miller was drafted by New Orleans out of TCU. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He is he's going to be behind Alvin Kamara and Jamal Williams. However, uh, Alvin Kamara does have some uh, perhaps legal issues floating in the ether in true, Las true. Vegas. So we'll see how that shakes out. But they're those three guys are either going to be like the Damian Pierce or the Eliza, Elijah Mitchell, the ones yeah. before the draft who just start getting hyped up and and you, you're you going to want a piece of them. And you know, and maybe this is just me and I'm just projecting this on everyone else. I always end up just not buying the hype for redraft in that case. But I'm like, you should because running backs can be good immediately. And um, or the other scenario here is that they don't, get that much buzz right away but then like a month into the fantasy season you're dumping your entire fab to try to grab one of these guys because uh uh jeff wilson went down or because deontay foreman wasn't doing what he needed to do and Khalil herbert still sucks in pass protection it it could all change and i think that that's what these guys are going to be um i i I talked myself into all three of them like i wish i had Wish I had done more running back work before the draft because I keep on looking at the wide receivers in my dynasties. I feel like there's a way it's like, they're not like handcuff running backs. They're like, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to think of a good brand, a good brand for these guys. Cause I feel like it's, it's, it's a common thing and you can find them pretty much every year where it's like third plus round running back that's drafted. Um, and into what feels like a crowded running back room. But really when you actually think about it and break it down, it's, there's kind of a clear path for them to get not the whole backfield, but maybe a majority of it or a large portion of it, especially when we get later into the season. Um, and those are guys especially in redraft, like target them late, like with your last few rounds, what's going to be, you know, who cares there. And then in a dynasty are great guys to snag and you can always use them as trade bait. Trade bait. Yeah, it's, TBBs. It's, it's like if, uh, remember when the Mission Impossible series was going to hand over the franchise from Tom Cruise to Jeremy Renner? Oh my God, they were? Yeah, that's why he was in um, Rogue Nation and Ghost oh. Protocol. I might be the only one in the world that is, <laughs> cares about this. But, but anyway, that's I mean, what they were going to do. They were going, to, because they had the three Mission Impossible movies. Yeah. They started a new franchise and they're like, all right, who's going to carry Mission Impossible? We want it to be kind of like James Bond. And Tom Cruise is like, Nah, I'm fucking Tom Cruise. I got jet fuel in my blood. This is my franchise too. So some of these rookie running backs could be Jeremy Renner going in, trying to usurp Tom Cruise. And some of them are going to be like, no, this is my team. This is my franchise. I'm running this series. Um, But some of them could also be like the rock coming in in fast five and just being like, I'm fucking here, baby. I have a Everybody fundamental piece of your narrative. Me. This this is how we reboot the franchise, how we get the team rolling, and I'm an important part of this. The analogy doesn't hold up quite as much because of <laughs> the last couple of movies, but <laughs> the sentiment remains the, the same. The sentiment is there. I like For it. all my movie heads out there. I love it. I love it. I love it. Rockbacks? Or can we call them rockbacks? Or... or... I don't know. There's something there. We'll workshop it. Yeah. I I feel like the receivers, the rookie receivers are more like handcuffs this year than yeah. I agree the with running that. backs, weirdly. I agree with that. I agree with that. I feel like, and it was just because there weren't a lot of running backs I felt like that were, correct me if I'm wrong, it didn't feel like there were any really like second round running backs. Right, you had you had Bijan Robinson and Jameer Gibbs in the first, and then I feel like everyone else was like the third or the fourth. And I feel like those second round backs are the ones where you tend to, um, like that that those are closer up to to uh, first round running backs in terms of like, oh yeah, I feel like this is this team is like committed to them and they're going to step into a role at some point or some like that. There's a clear pathway, and then third and later, especially fourth and later feels like like yeah maybe something happens maybe something doesn't like that's like the Ramondre Stevenson right the the Patriots drafted him and I think in like the fourth round and then they're like okay Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson did something happen there and then 
Um, and then it did happen. Talk to me about these tight ends, Jordan, because there were a lot of tight ends. This was a very tight end heavy class. And we all know that getting the difference maker at tight end can set your team up uh, for decades of dynasty success. Uh, where do you, what are you feeling about these Titans? Because we had the Sam Laporta to the lions, Michael Mayer to the Raiders, uh, Luke Musgrave to the Packers. What else? Uh, Luke he Schumacher the to, the, first. to the Cowboys. And then, and then, yeah. And then, and then Dalton, uh, Dalton Kincaid to the bills in the, in the first, all those guys feel like they could, they could be in, in the, in an offense that could utilize them from day one. Yeah. I was a little surprised that Sam Laporta went ahead of Michael Mayer. Um, but the, the weird thing about Iowa is they have a, they run a garbage offense, but, and their defense isn't that great either, but they produce a lot of NFL players, like a weird amount of weird NFL proportion. players that come out of Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Maybe Detroit saw, saw a D-biter there. Um, but I, I do like that landing spot for him in particular. Any tight end would have been good there because there's not a lot of competition. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it would be easy for him to get a head start on claiming that tight end spot in Dynasty. Um, I don't know if I like a lot of these guys for redraft. I would I would take a, the strongest look, I think, at Kincaid. Yeah. Um, if his back holds up, I that's going to be a great pick, not only for uh, redraft, but for dynasty leagues as well. I anticipate Kincaid, I, they have Dawson Knox, but I anticipate him being more of a, hey, we need a viable number two pass catcher because mm-hmm. Gabe Davis disappeared on us. And, um, you know, Khalil Shakir didn't really work out. And Isaiah McKenzie is the other one. Yep. I think, um, yeah, we need somebody opposite of Stefan Diggs. And if it's a, uh, athletic tight end who can move down the st- seam and work the middle of the field. That's Dalton Kincaid to a T. He's going to be an athletic, like number two pass catcher in Buffalo. Um, the other ones I, th- I think are just going to probably take some time. Um, I really do like the, um, I got to give props to my Packers, ma'am. I, I do think people were mad after round one. Cause they didn't, they didn't take a pass catcher and off like, Jackson Smith and Jigbo would have been very cool, but I I was on team offensive tackle and the guy I wanted went before our pick at 13. Anyway, I like Luke Musgrave. I like them double dipping for Tucker craft later. Like Mm -hmm. I I think that that's something the Packers have been prone to do. I think a couple years back to the draft when they took Jamal Williams, I believe in the third or the fourth and then like Aaron Jones in the fifth. Fuck yeah. it. We're, we're doubling up and look who won the job there. Aaron Jones is still in Green Bay and one of the best backs we've had um, in that franchise, which is saying a lot. Um, so I, I like one of those guys eventually for Dynasty to to pop. Luke Musgrave is a pretty athletic guy. He uh, During the draft, we kept hearing about his downhill skiing and his parents were like downhill skiers or whatever. And I'm like, Great. Love I it. love when a tight end comes from a weird alternative sport. <laughs> like when when everybody was talking about Gasicki playing volleyball, and I'm like, fuck yeah, look at him. He can jump six feet into the air. Of course he played volleyball. <laughs> Luke Musgrave has probably got really strong hips and can get off the line really well. So fluid. I, I just yeah, fluid hips, man. Um let's get Luke Musgrave some love. But yeah, um, how about how about you? What what are you looking at for tight ends? Yeah, I like the Kincaid. Kincaid, I feel like is is this the the my favorite of this group, simply because of the fact that he might not be like a tight end. The you know the, you know, the Bills and he's athletic enough mm-hmm. that the Bills could line up all over the place. Like Dawson Knox is there. They gave Dawson Knox you know a, a four year contract. Like that's their tight end. But Kincaid might be just like kind of a offensive weapon. And they kind of utilize him. And I hate to make this reference, um, but like it could be like the old Patriots offenses with Gronk and the other tight end that they had. Um, and just like having and having that hyper athletic guy 
who can move around the formation and do a whole bunch of different things. And the Bills have just like Josh Allen has been dying for a number two like receiver, someone to compliment Stefan Diggs, someone who he can look to outside of Stefan Diggs. And if that is Dalton Kincaid, holy shit, like that, that's that is a huge, huge offensive weapon uh for fantasy because Josh Allen's gonna throw the football and Josh Allen's gonna target their number two target like upwards of a hundred times, no problem. So if if that pans out for him, I love that. Um Michael Mayer to the Raiders is one where like I want to like it a lot. I don't know if it, like a like Josh McDaniels offense certainly knows how to utilize a tight end. Jimmy Garoppolo certainly knows how to utilize a tight end. So like the, the recipe is there, but they also have Foster Moreau. I know that's not like a huge challenger at the position. It's not, but it is another body there. I'll be very curious to see what Michael Mayer's kind of like, you know, we talk about pre hype, uh, preseason hype, look, hype mix. See what that kind of looks like to him. If he if he wins outright, like very clearly the tight end one job there and can cement himself as like a number two target next to Devontae Adams or maybe number three behind um um who's the slot boy? Run for run for info. Uh like I could get on board with him. My only worry there is like I'd have to see what I'll be interested to see where ADP falls for these rookies, uh rookie tight ends in both redraft. Uh, but I think more so, I think I agree with you, Jordan. Like tight ends is always, rookie tight ends are always kind of a weird bet um, in in redraft. It's always kind of, there's there's pretty risky. Uh, but in terms of dynasty, uh, I'm curious to see where kind of Michael Mayer fits in, in terms of, in terms of tight end dynasty rankings. Because like in terms of name value and draft value, right? Well, not where he was drafted, but where he was expected to be drafted. Like he was expected to be the tight end one of this class and a strong tight end class, but that didn't happen. Does that change his value at all? If I can get him at a discount, I'll go for it. But if he's, you know, going as the tight end one in this class, or maybe like on par with uh, Dalton Kincaid, maybe I'm not like totally sold in taking him there. Yeah. Um, I do. When, when you were mentioning, um, Jimmy G and um, Josh McDaniels. I was like, well, yeah, they do have experience with uh, Rob Gronkowski and using tight ends. And who was basically the most gronkiest prospect in this bunch? And people were saying it was Michael Mayer. So yeah. um, I, I, with that, I ended up changing my mind on Michael Mayer. I'm like, I would actually Ooh. take a flyer on him and redraft. Um Part of it does have to do. I'm looking at some redraft rankings right now. Okay. Um, where he's positioned, I think you can get a pretty damn good value for him. Um, but a- another part of the um, Josh McDaniels of it all and the Jimmy Garoppolo of it all is, I-, I had forgotten how much how good Jimmy G is at throwing over the middle, and Michael Mayer is a guy who can just vacuum up uh, middle of the field targets, and he is he's a good red zone guy. Like I could, you put I like how in, you, uh, Michael, you hearing what I said and now you telling me back to it, telling what I said to back to me. I'm now like, you're convincing me now. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh shit, this actually does sound pretty good. <laughs> this might be what is called an echo chamber. <laughs> <laughs> it's might- for football. So it's harmless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's exactly um, what this is. But like he he's a vacuum for targets. Like he's not the he doesn't have the, like the greatest catch radius in the world. But if you put it near him, he's got the strong like body and hands to take that ball away. I can see him sucking up a bunch of red zone touchdowns. Uh, right now he's tight end twenty one. Michael in Mayer, is Dalton, yeah, okay. Dalton Kincaid is listed as tight end fifteen. Oh wow, um, they are behind guys like. Uh, well, Michael Mayer is behind Jawan Johnson, who I kind of like this year. I do. Um, Gerald Everett, Mike Kosicki, and Dawson, Dawson Knox, and Taysom Hill. I, I think he can have a better year than all of them. Yeah. Uh, and then Dalton Kincaid is next, but uh, right ahead of him is Grant Dul- or Greg Dulcich with Denver. Um, <laughs> they also have another tight end uh, there yep. by the name of uh, – what- Albert is he? Yeah, Albert Aquagbenum, I think, is how you pronounce it. Um, 
So th- that's already a messy situation. Um, Chugo Okonkwo, I like him. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> um, that. But it, it just, it's a stark reminder of how shallow tight end is. Uh, yeah. Only like five of these guys matter. If you have enough bench spaces in redraft or you're – you're going to have to draft one of these guys, I think. Uh, so I, I don't be afraid of Kincaid and in Mayer if you want a backup tight end. I, I think you could be rewarded in that regard. Um, can I also give you a this is this is called the long haul in Dynasty. Uh, Darnell Washington to the Steelers. Mm. That's there might be a long time before you get any payout. Eh. But the man is like 6'7", 260. And if the Steelers know how to do anything, it's develop pass catchers. I like, snagged him in the third round. Dude, very nice. Very nice. He might be a guy where like the first two seasons, he's really just kind of a six offensive lineman. And so it doesn't give you a whole lot of fantasy value. But if he can continue to improve his like pass catching and, and being a, a all around tight end and a, and a basket, like, I mean, how are you going to stop that in the red zone? You're not. And so that he's a guy who, uh, in, in Dynasty, redraft, I wouldn't touch him. And Dynasty, yeah, throw throw a third round or a fourth round at him and, like, have him just sit on your bench until he starts putting up numbers. Yeah, it, if you thought getting a tight end in redraft was hard, try getting one in <laughs> Dynasty when you don't have one. Oh, like, yeah. You either have to pay a pretty good premium to get Travis Kelsey or Mark Andrews, maybe George Kittle. I'm not sure if he holds that much value anymore, but you have to pay a pretty penny for one of those guys. Um, Kyle Pitts, God bless him. <sighs> but he's the perfect example of no matter how good a prospect is, Kills me. it still is very hard to learn the tight end position. Uh, he is a little bit behind the curve just because of how difficult Arthur Smith's offense is to learn. But at the same time, the I've hammered this for years. Uh, statistically, it takes at least three years for a tight end to finally break out in their third year. Um, you have the exceptions. I, Gronk was, I think, a pretty obvious exception. Um, I'm not sure how long it took Travis Kelsey, but like you, you, you just have to look at some of these guys. Like TJ Hawkinson is the tight end four right now. He was a first round guy. Um, Dallas Goddard. Not a first round guy, Kyle Pitts, first round. Darren Waller, <laughs> Darren Waller wasn't good until he was like 28, 29 years old. So yeah. it's it's a crap shoot. I'm I'm a big fan in Dynasty of throwing capital at some guys with traits. Like yeah, uh, the thing that made Washington drop is maybe he's not as good of a mover as uh, we would hope, and he might have a foot thing. That's not great for a football player in general, but it, like you said, it's, it's the organization also in which there are just certain teams, certain units where you're like, you know what? I trust the player to go there and be okay Mm -hmm. at least, or at least turn into a reputable football player. I trust that of Pittsburgh, of New England, uh, Philadelphia is starting to get into that tier right now. I trust my green Bay Packers to, at least develop a pretty decent football player. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, all right, Jordan, before we go, is there any other, f- is there anyone who you want to plant a flag in early on any, any kind of like maybe later round guys or sleeper guys here? Like this is a guy, I think that the low key, the landing spot was great. The fit was great. He's a, he's someone that you should be monitoring. Maybe not, you know, not a, uh, high value or, or like a first round, second round, third, you know, those kinds of guys, but just like guys, a name that you shouldn't be ignoring in your fantasy drafts this year. Um, God, I, I have a few that I would just do. like to. Of course you do. I, <laughs> um, starting off with the obvious, uh, Jonathan Mingo for the Carolina Panthers. Yep. I, oh shoot. Of course I, uh, Got Just close out my my close my tab. I, I was looking at the Panthers depth chart because the top three wide receivers right now are Terrace Marshall, Adam Thielen, and DJ Chark. Uh, I think Jonathan Mingo could end up being better than all of them. Uh, he was a very good prospect coming out. He was 
potentially getting first round buzz. He didn't quite get up there. I think it might be, uh, I think he's 23 or so. Um, no, he's 22, but still, um, is there, there was something that he wasn't getting quite all the way up. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was testing. I think that he could be a wide receiver one when it's all said and done for Carolina. Um, he might be a guy we hear those, uh, highlight real stories out of, especially yeah. with, um, working with the rookie, working with Bryce Young. I bet you they've already connected on draft night, just already building the chemistry. I always like that. Um, another guy I wanted to – I would shout out is um, uh, Marvin Mims. Yes. He was, he was Denver. On list. Yes. Uh, he, he was a pretty good prospect, um, and he – I, I think he was getting round one buzz, not not in this past draft cycle, but maybe one or two draft cycles ago. I think it was when he was playing with Caleb Williams at Oklahoma. Um, I, I like him in Denver to be uh, – Danny Kelly said at best, moon balls all day there with Russell Wilson. I yeah. think he could really just grab that K.J. Hamler role and just wrestle it away from him. There still might be some movement with wide receivers there as well. Um, that's, Rashi Rice, Kansas City. Yeah, that's that same situation. Marvin Mims is the guy to me where it's like you draft him now because he already could have good value this season. We know that Russell Wilson, yeah, loves to can when Russell Wilson was in Seattle, we'll ignore what he did last year in Denver. Russell Wilson has shown an ability to throw a very nice deep ball. Uh, and Marvin Mims can certainly succeed with that. Uh, but he is a guy that you draft now because he has value now, but also if they did trade Jerry Judy or trade Cortland Sutton, all of a sudden Marvin Mins becomes like a legit, like fantasy viable wide receiver for, for 2023. And if you've already got him on roster, you are sitting super pretty. So he's a guy I'm certainly targeting this, this year because of that, because of the fact that there could be another domino to fall. And even if there's not a domino to fall, he has a role that he could claim pretty quickly that could lead to really efficient Big time fantasy performances. Yes, um, <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, Tim Patrick tore his ACL last year. I really liked him going into the year, but he also might have one of those like two year Cooper Cup ACL injuries um, where he where it just takes him a while to get comfortable again. So there there's some there's some wiggle room for Mims um, for the That's dynasty true. community amongst you. Some deep cuts yes. that I'm just going to give away, even though Pete, we haven't had our rookie draft. We yet. haven't I'm just thrown it I'm out right, there. I'm anyway. writing these down right um, now, Jordan. Uh, Puka Nakwa, the uh, wide receiver drafted by the LA Rams um, out of BYU. He is a pretty sturdy 6'2 wide receiver who is. Um, He's one of those. He's one of those gadget guys, man. He's going to be getting some end arounds. He's a pretty decent route runner, maybe a little bit of refining to go there. Um, I believe I had his breakout age at like nineteen, um, nineteen point nine or something like that. Maybe it was, maybe it was a twenty point one. I might be mixing him up with my next guy, um, but he he is a guy who just by virtue of his landing spot could could be looking pretty nice there with the Rams. They're like, their team is like 40% rookies right now. So um, <laughs> you might see him get some carries. They have a messy running back situation. So um, he's somebody that could be pretty valuable to you in dynasty late. Uh, and A.T. Perry for the New Orleans Saints. Yes. I like his landing spot. Damn, Jordan. Big man, big 6'2", 6'3". Guy, I was watching some tape on him. Um from this past year at Wake Forest, man, he's, he's the quarterback was pretty bad, man. Like he, he, he turps some balls that uh, should have went for, went for touchdowns. Uh, one of the games I watched AT Perry scored three touchdowns in the first half. And I was like, there's the prospect. Um, he has a pretty low breakout age too. Uh, like I said, I might've confused him with Puka Nakwa, but I think it was 20. And um yeah, a, another guy by virtue of situation, it could open up pretty nicely for him in New Orleans. There's not a, I mean, Rashid Shahid was like maybe their only guy who was consistent last year. 
uh, Michael Thomas, who the hell knows? So there could be some boundary opportunities for A.T. Perry there. Yeah, I really like the A.T. Perry call. That was that was going to be my final. You just took all my guys, Jordan. You got took them all. Sorry, I, I just started rambling and just started going. <laughs> Hey, that's that's what the people pay uh, to hear. Uh, Deuce Vaughn quickly for the Cowboys. Not not a bad not a bad play, especially with Tony Pollard kind of coming off of injury, and there's no more Ezekiel Elliott in that backfield. Just another dart, another dart to just kind of throw from Steph Steph Curry range. See if it hits. Deuce Vaughn is like fast. Also, he's like a quick little guy. Like I, he could be like sprulzy. Oof. for the Cowboys. I, I do love me some Darren Sproles. Um, all right. Well, that's all we got for you this week. Make sure you rate and subscribe to the podcast on your podcast platform of choice and follow us on Twitter at NerdballFF. You can follow myself at PM Rogers and follow Jordan at Jordan underscore Smith 27. Uh, and make sure you're checking out all the content we're putting out at NerdballFF.com. I said at weirdly, and then I kind of did the whole Nerdball in an accent. I don't know. Didn't read. Uh, Until next week, my fellow nerds.